Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Liz Bothwell from Waste 360 with Keith Harrison, CEO of the Recycling Partnership. Welcome, Keith, and thanks so much for being here. Very happy to be here today. Thanks for having me. I know a bit about your background as one of our favorite 40 Under 40 winners, but could you please share with our audience a bit about your background and how you fostered such a passion for the environment and the industry? I've been working in recycling for more than 20 years now. I started off at a a college recycling program as an environmental educator with them, and I ran the program after graduation. I worked with the state office in North Carolina, Um, and then while... uh, We moved after my husband finished grad school and started a family. So I worked part-time for three organizations at once. So I worked with the Association of Plastics Recyclers, the Southeast Recycling Development Council, and Booz Allen on some EPA work. And it really taught me how we're all trying to work towards the same thing, but we have a different approach. And so I really launched my own work on trying to build better cross-sector solutions. Um, And when I worked with RRS, That's exactly what I worked on. And there, um, I was on the team that built this model that is now the Recycling Partnership. So my recycling space has been, um, you know, I've been immersed on multi-materials from different perspectives. And it's been a, it's really nice to pull all those together and land in a nonprofit that works with companies and communities on um, being fierce change agents. Um, So it's, it's a good way to build into it. But before I got into recycling, I uh, was really in, uh, on the track to become a biologist. So I did some work on uh, sea turtle habitat or sea turtle um, tagging and research in Costa Rica. I did uh, mountain bog turtle in North Carolina. I, I worked on a sustainable logging crew in North Carolina, and I also studied some reindeer husbandry in Finland. So I really tried to, I really, you know use that time before getting immersed in, in recycling to explore all the options out there. Wow, you really did. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us more about your amazing work, baby, the Recycling Partnership? I would love to hear about the yes. model um, and the partnerships and ultimately its effect on communities and recycling at large. It's been one of the most exhausting and exhilarating work babies ever. Uh, so five and a half years ago, we had one staff person, me. Uh, we are just hiring a new round of folks that will push us more than 45 core staff. And then we have a great network of uh, consulting teams and advisory groups and research teams and accounting and legal that help us beyond that. So we've, we've really had a, uh, a, a steep year over year growth. Um, and I think the success of that, um, our ability to have year over year, is really rooted in the fact that um, we are we are all about change, and we work hard to make change on the local level, but to connect that with the system needs. And um, and the partnership has just been been a joy. And I think everyone that I work with now, uh, you know, just an amazing group of people. They just bring such passion and man, they are wicked smart. It's, uh, it's intimidating, but they're also so boisterous and and engaged. And, um, you know, they were just all up in, I live in New Hampshire, and uh, we have a couple of in-person meetings a year where we pull everyone together. So we brought everyone up to rural New Hampshire, and we took over every inn and Airbnb and um, DBNB and uh, even my guest room. And um, and we spent four days together really mapping out the next, you know, 18 months. And what a passionate, exciting group of people. It was like the whole town just was, you know, just lighted up with all these energetic people. They were out and about in green capes once for a scavenger hunt. <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> that was not typical in this old New England town. But we uh, they brought their energy here, and everyone liked it. That was good. Oh, that's great! What a, what a cohesive unit you have. That's amazing. And then, how about some of the partnerships? I mean, I I read that you did a um, 
a partnership with PepsiCo worth $10 million. That's unbelievable, Keith. So how do you and the recycling partnership ensure that that investment goes where you want it to go and they want it to go? I love that question. You know, I, I'm getting it more and more, and I think that it's a good question, one that everyone should ask. You know, as companies are making their commitments to the environment and setting some goals, how, how are they backing them? And um, one, one way to measure that is the number of dollars they're putting behind their commitment. But another is deciding who their partners are. And they need action agents. They need subject matter experts. They need groups that are trusted in getting stuff done. And that's what the partnership does. And so when a company joins us to get work done, like the PepsiCo um, 25 million family challenge, all in on recycling. Um, we we say we'd love to have you partner with us, um, but first you have to agree in our mission because we are fiercely mission driven. And then second, you have to fund it, which is kind of a funny thing. But sometimes companies like we love what you're doing. Would you take something in exchange? And no, our work takes actual hard cash because we give grants to communities. So the second is you have to fund it, and then the third is that you're willing to play well with others. Partnership is part of our name for a reason, and collaboration sounds like a kumbaya word, but it is actually really hard, and we take that part of collaboration and working with competitors um, to, make, to make change very seriously, and, um, and so the relationships that we have with our funding partners are very pure. We don't work with partners who want to corrupt our mission. We work with partners who want to advance it. And in order to do that, we have to understand why are they at this table? So, you know, that cross-sector work I mentioned earlier, everyone's here for a different reason. Everyone wants recycling to work for a different reason. If you're a hauler, if you're a MRF, if you're a community, if you're a citizen, you're, you're all doing this word called recycling, but you're actually doing a different action and your intent behind it is different. So we work very hard to understand why our funding partners are at the table, and how do they need to measure their ROI and their relationship with us? Because sometimes it's about the tonnage. Sometimes it's about the community engagement. Sometimes it's about a specific material. But in order to get any of those individual interests, you really have to elevate the whole. So uh, I think the root of our relationship with our partners is all in action, uh, working hard to understand them, and then um, making, you know, being really clear that we hold, you know, we hold them accountable. It's a, it's a fascinating balance of we, we, we need your funding to advance our mission. Our mission will advance your goals, company. Uh, however, we have to hold each other accountable to being um, as just as productive as possible with every single dollar. And, and like you're saying, there's so many different stakeholders, right? It's you have your funding partners, you have the community in which you want to implement change, and then you have your your own group. So do you, do you have stakeholders, like, for example, at PepsiCo, will you work with a, one person or a group um, in an ongoing, on an ongoing basis to make sure that it gets implemented? And same goes for, say, the community and, and your team as well. I guess, how do you roll that out um, and make everybody accountable on a regular basis? I just think you're a skilled collaborator, Keith, and I think anything you can share in that <laughs> regard will, will help so many people in our audience, um, whether it's in <laughs> partnerships like that or day-to-day -day working with people in general. So one example that I think is really cool is our relationship with the state of Ohio. Uh, they were trying to tackle contamination challenges statewide, and, um, and we together to build an approach where their grant dollars are going directly to communities. So not through us, directly to communities to use our materials. So our funders are, are funding our staff to develop resources, outreach campaigns, our new DIY sign tool, our climate um, measurement platforms, our new municipal measurement program. So the whole program that is the partnership is funded by our by our funders, um, and it's lined up against the state grants in Ohio. So those dollars are going directly to, to communities from the state and multiplied by ours, both in terms of resource and some cash and development. And the product is so much bigger than what the state of Ohio could have done or what, what any one company could have done with a city in Ohio. The collective 
um, the collective change that we are able to see through that collaboration um, is really a model that we like to show, um, that we like to put forward of how we could do this in other places. Um, so in that instance, you know, it's, it's our, it's companies funding our mission. We call them mission dollars, right? Like it's not a one-off project. It's not a research program. It's not something specific to PepsiCo or one company. It's the company believing in our mission to align with the state of Ohio and deliver Ohio wide what needs to happen. Um, and so in that sense, uh, it's the, it's the model that people believe in uh, and it's the metrics that result from it. And it's also less tangible, but kind of the uplift of energy, the, the excitement that people are making that they're not alone in this, that they see companies, nonprofits, communities, states in the same space. And um, I think that's, that's really where this comes to. So, you know, it's not that funders come to us so much with, you know, if we, if we give you cash, could you do this one off project for us? But we, we don't work in that realm. We work in what, identifying the system changes that are needed in the U S recycling system and then designing projects that uh, address local and state challenges against those system changes. So it's really uh, a lot of work on our team's part to, to map the progress of change and then to bring funders and states and cities and nonprofits and MERFs and haulers and everybody along into these system change pieces. It's, um, it's nimble, it's fast, and it's, uh, it's very much a roll up the sleeves and get stuff done sort of approach. Definitely. Well, and you've made such progress already in, in five short years. And I know when you originally won the 40 under 40 award back in 2016, I think you said something around um, you generated more than 20 million in new recycling infrastructure investment. Has that number gone up? <laughs> yep. We, uh, so our June import tax report that came out, we uh, measure more than $73 million of uh, value into the system. So that's about $43 million in new infrastructure. Um, and then what's really fascinating in these challenging times is um, our grants are always needed. Our dollars to buy infrastructure like carts and trucks are always needed. Um, however, we just, um, what's being asked for more and more is just help um, our technical staff. We call it our human capital, so not our fiscal capital, but our human capital is in high demand. How do I work on this contract? How do I deal with these increased costs? How do I think about my routing for efficiency? What should our finances look like? How do I work with my mayor to understand priorities or our city council when they're struggling with a budget that has to pay for fighting homelessness, paving roads, supporting school kids, and recycling? Like, how, how do I make our case? So our, the demand for our human capital is, um, is increasing more and more. And What's interesting around that is we um, we recently hosted the 50 Cities Leadership Summit. So we convened 50 of the biggest cities in the country, and we asked them to join us and our funders for a multi-day meeting where we explored what does it really mean to launch a circular economy, not just, you know, the academics of it, not just in one city, but across cities. And we look at this as a, as a multi-year engagement um, to really be the on-the-ground activator for a circular economy. And as part of that, we generated, um, we generated $2 million worth of new grants just for those 50 cities to see, you know, to help them address their challenges. And we put out a request for information. Tell us what you need. Not, you know, do you want to put in for an RFP for this CART grant, but what is holding your program back? And the request for grants, far exceeded our $2 million budget. It was far exceeded a $10 million budget. And what we found is that um, communities need a lot of help with staff. They just need, they need good, strong bodies getting work done. Um, and then second, you know, better tools around contamination. I think we've not really been true with ourselves. So what does it really cost a community program to operate? Our feet on the street tagging for reducing contamination is the most effective uh, way to reduce contamination. It's just not super cheap. But the question shouldn't be, you know, 
we can't do something that isn't super cheap. The question should really be, what is the true cost of re- re- running a recycling program? It includes staff. It includes operations like being on the street to engage citizens and to make sure that we've got a clean stream going into the front door of the MRF. And, and, and so these requests for our grants really, um, uh, there was also a lot of requests for multifamily, really showed us the nature of the problem from the community perspective and allows us to bring back to our funding partners you know, the real needs of them so that we're, we're really trying to listen hard and respond to and uh, lift up our community partners. That's amazing. And it sounds like you're doing that kind of work, that feed on, on the street work um, in Atlanta, too. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because it looks like contamination numbers are down and recycling overall is up. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that program, too. Yep. So we currently have more than 1,400 community partners across the country. And that means everyone from um, communities like Atlanta that are receiving significant grants from us to really tackle problems like contaminations and operations and education and and advancing towards the circular economy, um, uh, all the way to the other side of people who are downloading our resources or using that new DIY sign tool that I mentioned. So everything we build for a full granted community, we make accessible in open source through our website, our webinars, our workshops. Um, and, and we feel very strongly that uh, we need to make sure that anything we have is available for all. So anyone can call us up and say, how do I run a feed on the street program? And we've got a downloadable kit that we can walk them through and say, okay, here you go. You can download this and you start first with really understanding the core contaminants. You, um, once you've got those, and we've got the standard five that most MRFs, um, uh, you know, are faced as a challenge, like things in bags, bags themselves, tanglers, fire hazards, and and icky, stewy, icky gooey things, right? Those are generally the top five contaminants. And then with those, but we want to make sure that those are locally accurate. And then with that, um, we can help them build cart hangers, or sorry, cart tags or cart hangers and um, social media platforms. They're all ready to go. They just need to be customized for the city. Um, and then we even have driver training videos. We have step-by-step guides. And we just worked on developing a new app so that it's not people out with clipboards who are tracking contamination rates and measuring change over time. We've made that easier by partnering to develop an app on that. So uh, the work that we're doing in Atlanta uh, is a very formalized way of that, but it allowed us to build it for everyone else. And so we're seeing the adoption of those programs uh, in many communities across the country. Wow, that's amazing. And you've really thought this through and I really want to hear about the app and the adoption of that once you really roll that out and the success of that as well. And you mentioned how you have a lot of plug and play stuff ready so that it, it's really a streamlined approach um, for communities. And uh, you mentioned having sort of, you know, the social media ready to roll too. And I think that's what stands out too, is you, you add a, a bit of creativity to everything. Like for example, your partnership with Poland Spring and the Instagram hotline, that was brilliant. Can you tell us a little bit about the origin of that and, and how that went or is going? Yeah, uh, that's been a, that's been a fun one. And, um, and a little bit of a foray into a space that was new for us. Um, Poland Springs came to us with an idea. It's something that we had toyed around with, but we had never had um, the the funding to do. And I said we don't do just one-offs, but when it's on our wish list and we can connect a new funding source to a wish list, then we get busy at it. Um, and so the videos that were produced out of it and then the real-time feedback on recyclability um, helped us to really learn how to use a new social media platform. And um, and we're looking forward to building that into a much bigger uh, across a much bigger platform with um, Instagram and Facebook that would be uh, available to many communities and can't quite go into it net more, but in 2020, we'll be able to give the details to everyone. Oh, that's great. Okay. Keep us posted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, on our website, there's um, a full, you know, year long calendar of social media posts. That's everything from the most, you know, it's, it's, meant to be a grab and go tool for any community who wants to run social media or um, 
but it really doesn't have the bandwidth. So there's graphics that you can just pull and plug right into your Instagram feed or your Twitter account. And it's everything from holidays to key contaminants to uh, material, you know, details about material specific things like pizza boxes or cartons or, um, so we, we really tried to make ready to go materials, but they all, they're not standalone documents. They're all tested in best management practice. They're connected to our, our resource, our resources around action. So we, we really, with our community partners, we try to really think about coupling community outreach with the action. So whether it's rolling out a new part of a program or reinforcing, you know, the increased recovery of good materials or avoiding contamination of the challenging ones, you know, we really want to always tie the message to the community or to the citizen with the action that the community is taking. So um, that we're really, you know, think of it like a stacked cake. We want any any community in this country to be able to um, to enter the recycling partnership resources and and begin to have a, a year long or, or more relationship with their citizens through our tools. And the result is not just that the citizens know more, but that the community program has also improved. Um, and that's why the new rollout of our DIY signs is very exciting to us because it was one of the missing pieces, you know, communities were coming to us saying, we like how we can custom design some posters and mailers and cart tags, but we need stickers. And, and basically what they needed is, you know, community programs who are basically one person with a desktop printer. That's, that's all they have. They don't have budget. They don't have anything, but they have that. We wanted this tool to be able to allow that person to create top of best of class graphics that are rooted in uh, communication standards um, that connect with the rest of our tools that they can make theirs. You know, none of the stuff we produce is trademarked only to us. We want people to own it. We want them to take it and make it theirs. And they have another way of messaging. That's great. But for all of those who don't, we make, we, we want to make it as easy and beautiful as possible. And we don't need the credit. You know, they can take it to their boss and own all the credit that's great. <laughs> then they win and we win and the whole program system gets better. Right, exactly. And I love how you've taken uh, all of the community's um, pain points and needs to heart and have really adapted um, and created a program that will work for all of them. I think that's part of the key to your success, really. I love how you aren't afraid to tackle big challenges head on. Now, are you still doing work in, with the Ocean Conservancy? Yes, we are um, part of the Trash Free Seas Alliance, and we work on ocean materials. So uh, we have a whole line of grants that are targeted around major waterways. You know, we're very clear that recycling cannot solve um, marine debris, but it can be part and should be part of a comprehensive program to prevent it from getting there in the first place. And so we work actively uh, internationally to share resources, knowledge, data with any group that's working to develop solid waste systems to prevent leakage into the ocean. Um, so I was recently on a, um, a trip into the Atlantic with a group called Soul Buffalo that convened groups like ours and major corporations that produce plastics and um, Greenpeace was there and National Geographic. And the whole point was to say, uh, to, was to travel to, you know, we were east of Bermuda by something like 50 kilometers and, um, and to, to actually snorkel in the edge of the Sargasso Sea and see the effects of plastics in the ocean to help drive um, not just awareness, but commitments to action around that. And from there, we've built relationships with the World Bank and with, um, you know, with, with other groups that are in this space that are really trying to tackle the system's problems. And so um, we are active in those challenges. And I'm glad you I'm glad you called out that we're not afraid to have hard conversations. I think that's my number one job <laughs> in my role is to is to be a recycling realist of, you know, wish wishful thinking doesn't get us anywhere when we're trying to solve planetary problems like waste. Uh, we need to be really direct. We need to be data driven, uh, and we we need to be not afraid to take things head on. Um, and that often starts with a hard conversation. So whether that's plastics in the ocean, whether that's our, um, 
new and emerging policy uh, initiatives. That that another example of that is a report we're releasing later this month about bridging the gap to circularity. So, what can the current system deliver versus what does the system look like that would be able to deliver on companies' pledges to make everything recyclable by 2025? There is a lot of work to do between then and there, and we take seriously our job to uh, clearly articulate the nature of the problem and connect it to ideas around solutions. So we do not point fingers. We call and hold accountable players in the space, and we build solutions together, and then we help activate that. That's that's what uh, collaboration can't happen without conversation. True. Speaking of that, I mean, do you think the disconnect between those who want a circular system in place, the manufacturers, and then the plastics industry is getting any better? I think it's going to have to get better. Um, I think that people yeah. are exploring it. There's, um, there's a, uh, you know, there's the will is coming. Now we need the way. Um, and so mm-hmm. our report is meant to document, you know, a way to helping us to bridge the approach. But, you know, recycling is um, is a workhorse of a circular economy. Um, it pairs up with important but, you know, much to be studied and developed around reuse and around definitely around reduce. And um, but but there is no you know, when you pivot from an academic idea into action, it's clunky, but the um, but we don't have time to be clunky. We really mm-hmm. have no time to flirt around with ideas that are not rooted in clear pathways to success. That the very nature of our climate, of our waste, and of our material use of demand that we move quickly, seriously, and with uh, with intent. And um, so. Um, we're not there yet, uh, but we do see a lot of progress um, in building the momentum behind the intent to get there. And now uh, we look forward to working with others to build clear pathways of how we're going to do this. And this will take a lot of organizations like ours at the table and a lot more companies and the plastics industry in, in order to get there. The circular economy isn't just plastics to us. That's the shining light of the Ellen MacArthur program and the new plastics economy, but a circular economy is about molecules and keeping them in motion. And so we work very hard on the metals and the paper side of this as well. Uh, We want a better system for everything that is in the household and not just the historical packages that were recyclable, but think about what is in the household that ultimately um, breaks or is used or is done with and needs to be repurposed. We, you know, as we continue to work on the the circular economy, you can expect us to talk about it in terms of all materials, including those with like metals that have good in markets, but it still need a lot of work on getting it out of the household um, and to paper who has all this fabulous investment in U.S. infrastructure. And we need to really bridge the time to allow that to come in and keep that material moving, um, as well as plastics and glass and others. So um, this, I think people too quickly think that circular means plastic, and it, it means much more than that. Yes, definitely. And of course, because plastics has been thrust into the limelight, so you could see how that happens, but you're absolutely right. And also, I see that you're doing some state of curbside research. Do you have any gut feelings as to what may have changed since you did, did that back in 2016? Yes, uh, cost, uh, contamination, uh-huh. um, cost, cost for communities are going up. You know, we're seeing through our contracts work with communities, um, communities are coming to us with double, tripling their costs. Um, I think MRFs are right sizing what's the true cost of their operations and passing those costs back to communities, which is the way the system works. However, communities are not always prepared to take those. So that's going to be one of the big and the big shining lights on this updated state of curbside report. The second is um, is contamination. And I think really, you know, what I said earlier about we need to understand what is the true cost of running a program, <laughs> not just mm. how do you pick up materials and move them to a MRF, but really how do you fund uh, from household collection, which means multifamily and and single family, and I think we can't, you know, we can't really talk about circularity if we're not also talking about 
you know, business and institution. But for now, let's talk about it from a residential perspective. How do we truly fund successful um, movement of material into a recovery system? Um, I, I think we're going to have to get some right-sizing on cost around that. Uh, and uh, the other piece on the, um, the state of curbside is um, really the, the challenges that communities are facing with understanding increased concerns from citizens and matching those with goals from companies. You know, I think how does that kind of play out? So our state of curbside report is uh, this will be our, you know, our second go at it. We like we we keep our data rolling. Um, but we think it's really important to pause and look from a community point of view what's happening. Um, it marries nicely with the recent um, MRF survey that we did that we produced together with Sustainable Packaging Coalition. That's part of our asterisk relationship. Um, but that really tackles um, the major concerns from the MRF perspective. So when we can put together the state of curbside, the MRF report, and this upcoming um, circular economy report, we can really look at those tools as profile, better profiling the ultimate system. Oh, definitely. Oh, wow. I can't wait to hear about that. <laughs> I saw that you recently went on a grocery shopping trip with NPR to, to show them sort of, you know, what can and cannot be recycled. How was that? That must have been fun and educational, too. You know so much about recycling, and I'm sure the average person Shopping with the average person, you learn a lot along the way. How was that? I learned a lot. I have not. So that six-minute segment took 90 minutes on mic. So we had, I was, we were in a grocery store. I had the mic kind of stuffed inside my coat. Um, we were trying to do it on the down low. And spending 90 minutes talking with someone and looking at everything in a grocery store, I, I left with a completely different perspective than what I walked in with. I left looking at all those pouches, wraps, bags, and wondering, you know, and, and for the most part, tubes, like, this is the wave. There's a big new push of these packaging formats coming. And which of those does a Merck want? None. A Merck doesn't want any of them uh, because, uh, the mar- market challenges, the sortation challenges, the systems challenges of them are too great. So I left feeling like we've got to do something about this. And um, we just this week announced the launch of our Films and Flexibles work group. We started that with research of really what are the true end markets and potential end markets and potential to grow end markets for Films and Flexibles because there's no point in working on collecting them if you can't solve the end market. You have to start there. Um, and that is that that work was definitely reinforced by that grocery store trip of we've got to make, you know, no one knows the clear path there, but we have to get the competitors and collaborators who use this format, who create this format, who might be able to recycle this format someday in a room and start to have the hard conversations of how do we fix it and then how do we begin to test it. And you know, return to store retail is a good option for now, but we know we're only getting like 4% of the available polyethylene um, by that mechanism. And that just frankly isn't enough. So we've got to tackle, we can't just rely on the fact that it doesn't fit in a MRF for now. So it probably can't go anywhere. We've, we've got to, you know, that sort of thinking doesn't change problems and build solutions. And so we've, we've got to begin to tackle that. So my big takeaway was the future of what is in a household is very different than what has been in a household to date. And our organization uh, needs to partner with others um, like SBC, like APR, to create a pathway to recyclability, to be able to pull together um, packaging formats that do not enjoy strong recyclability from the system and work through a third-party a stage gate process that involves the appropriate third parties to really say from the end market perspective, here's what's holding back recycling. And from reprocessing perspective, here's the list. And from the MRF side, here's the list. From the consumer and the community side, you know, through every stage, every sector, what is preventing recyclability so that the packaging uh, format or the, the producer of that material uh, can work to tackle it uh, and overcome those challenges. So there is no pathway now, and we're working very hard to 
create a program that would allow us to resolve that. And here's here's yet another program that we, the partnership, cannot do alone. We must do with other groups like APR to do accurately. Um, and then we call on producers and companies to help work together with their competitors. So everyone who's packaging in a pouch could come together and say, okay, now we, we understand the, the nature, the size, and the cost of the problem. And we understand a pathway of how to overcome it. And we together decide to tackle it. So that's, that's one of the big outcomes from that grocery store. That's what I learned. And that's how we are pivoting it into action. And um, we'll be talking more about that at, uh, at some upcoming meetings later this year. Oh, great. Okay. We'll listen for more on that too. It's obvious you have a lot happening and you've accomplished a lot in the last five years. So what's your next big audacious goal for the Recycling Partnership? Policy ah, is it. Okay. Um, we, we, uh, when we were formed, policy was not part, we was understood to be a critical part of healthy recycling systems, but could not be part of our work plan. At our five-year anniversary, we see what are the headwinds that are challenging our whole industry. And we know that it's a, I think it's a far too conservative number, but our back of the envelope estimate is if we wanted to level up the current recycling system to make it operationally whole, and that means one, every household can recycle as easily as throw something away. So what are the carts and trucks that are needed for that? What minor MRF upgrades do we need to make sure that they can handle that volume? Just that leveling up, that capital cost is at least $7 billion. That's before you ever wow. operate it for a single minute. So what's the difference between the investments that we see the, um, uh, on, the, you know, on the producer side, and then we see what are the costs that we see on the community side, and do we see a gap between where we are now and that $7 billion plus operating costs? Uh, yeah, we see a gap. And so we've started some really critical conversations with our funding partners of what it means to um, to have hard conversations around policy. And we're, it, it means working, um, you know, in Florida to make sure that bills that are designed to, um, there's a bill in Florida that was, you know, designed to the intent to improve contamination rates, doesn't actually injure the current and future recycling system. It means working in Indianapolis that does not have a recycling program to help policymakers understand the importance of funding and then bringing together other grants to it. So the policy work is, um, is becomes a state level opportunity to lift up the system, but to also ask some hard questions. Like um, one really uncomfortable question that we have been asking is, what does it mean when the average U.S. tipping fee at a landfill is $47 a ton. And communities are, their costs to drop a load at the MRF are anywhere from $80 to $100 a ton. If the pure initial cost to recycle is double that to landfill, well, then that says that we do not have a national commitment to recycling or to circularity. That means that the economic upheaval uh, will immediately set Companies' sustainability goals at a loss. Right? They've they've got to first overcome right. that economic barrier before they can ever have a fighting chance. It means that community costs continue to rise, and um, that's an example of a really hard conversation that that the partnership is going to have has already begun uh, with our partners, with our communities, with our hauler and landfill friends and with our elected officials, and we need to have it in a bigger way uh, in coming months because we we can't talk about recyclability goals if we, we start off with that sort of economic disparity. No, you're absolutely right, and that's a it's a huge conversation, and um, it's great to see that that you're focused on that. That that will be a hard one. I just you know that's one that like no one really wants to do, but someone has to do. We have to ha we have to have the conversation. I'm not sure what the end is, but we have to have it, and and we do that under you know a policy umbrella, and um, it will really test our, you know I, I think our, our ability to have it is rooted in our action, in our background of collaboration, um, but it's gonna it's gonna make some people unhappy the very fact that we're having it at all. Right, exactly, and if progress is made, 
and I'm sure it will be, it will all be worth it. There's always discomfort before change happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what else do you think we should be paying attention to in the world of waste recycling and organics? The other thing is, you know, the personal interest. What do our citizens, you know, think? Like, you know, when you go to your book club or a cocktail party or, you know, you meet people as you're standing around at your kid's soccer game and you say what you do, you're in recycling. Like, doesn't it immediately go to, hey, what are those arrows about? And are caps on? Or what about boxes? You know, like people get pretty granular and they have they have this passion, but that passion is it's fragile because they want to know that it's worth their effort and that something's happening. And you marry that up with a concern about, you know, plastics in the ocean and with climate action. And you see a public who um, is worked up and is calling for action, but, but isn't sure that their individual actions are enough to, to make a difference. And so I think we in the waste and recycling space have a real opportunity to make sure that uh, consumers and citizens understand that every every bottle, can, carton, box, it all matters. And uh, every decision in our lives matter. And that when we speak up for concerns around the environment and concerns around climate action, that we're speaking up for ourselves, but we're also speaking up for our family and our neighbors and um, and for those things that don't have voices, like like whales, like turtles. You know, I'm going to circle back to where I started in with all of this of there is no time to be timid. Uh, it is it is very much um, the time to uh, really invent a recycling 2.0. And the public wants it, and we want to give it to them so that we keep them engaged. Um, companies want it because they're making goals, and, and frankly, our, our planet can't handle anything other than it. So true. You're absolutely right. So what advice would you give to professionals considering entering this wonderful industry? Take up an exercise because you'll need to burn off some steam. Um, the uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, come in and do serious work with with joy. I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things about our organization, you know, our, we have our core values that outline how we do our work um, and why we do our work. And it's you know, there there are several of them. One is partnership is part of our name for a reason. And another one is embrace change and drive action. But one of the the 10 is purposely have fun. And I like that. And the energy that, you know, I see our team bring to a space that is tired, that has more work than it has people or money or time um, is so needed. And so when people are coming into this field and I will, I would like to see more young people who want to work for the environment and sustainability, but don't know if waste and recycling and organics is sexy enough. I want to say, yes, yes, it is. And we need you. We need you to lift this up first. And then second, we need to make sure that it is not in a silo. Recycling has really been in, done a great job of making itself a singular issue. We've worked hard to connect it to water, to climate, and to healthy communities. And that means social action um, and making sure that, that everyone in a population has access, uh, equal access to, to recycling because that's a gateway to sustainable behavior. So as people are coming into this, come into it with energy, be ready to work hard and, um, and let's really connect it to the other issues that matter to the public, um, um, like water energy or water climate and community. And I think that will be that will bring us all a collective success. Definitely. I love that. And I love the way you approach it with intentionally having fun and, and the energy brought to it <laughs> is amazing. It makes all the difference. It really does. <laughs> so Keith, how can listeners hear more from you and the Recycling Partnership? Do you want to share your Twitter handle or your, or your URL? Yeah, my Twitter handle is Keith Harrison. That's pretty straightforward. K-E-E-F-E. Harrison, H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N. Um, our, you can check us out at recyclingpartnership.org. Uh, and there's an info line there if you want to just reach out and learn more. We want more people at the table, which means we hope that companies all along the supply chain look at the work that we're doing and say, yes, this is forwarding uh, a better system, which makes me better. And I want to be part of it either as a funding partner or an active uh, supporter of it, um, just 
you know, at conferences, I, I, you know, we want to know how we can help you advance uh, the whole. So, you know, having worked on the government side and the, the, the company side, now to be in the, the nonprofit side, it is just so fantastic to how seriously we take our obligation to, to deliver the tools, the resources, the knowledge, the data that we have to the industry, because we want everyone uh, who is in this space, and there are a lot of us, anyone who could use some of our stuff to be better, you know, what's ours is yours. And, and we, we take that, that service of giving and, um, and helping very seriously. So we don't hesitate um, to talk to anyone and we invite everyone to join us at the table. Oh, I love that. And I hope people take you up on that um, because you're doing mm-hmm. such good and we need it to continue. So well, Keith, this has been so awesome and, and thanks for your time and your energy today and for all that you're doing for the industry and the environment. You're making quite a difference and we can't wait to continue watching your journey. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. It was great chatting with you, Liz. Hi again. Thanks for listening today. And if you are as impressed as I am with the Recycling Partnership, you'll be happy to know that you can see them at Waste Expo talking about some of the feet on the street work that they've done at Atlanta. It'll be data-driven, it'll be interesting, and definitely worth your time. Check out wasteexpo.com for registration information.